Welcome to Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. I'm Dr. Dave Moylan, Medical Director of the Simon Kramer Cancer Institute in New Philadelphia in Schuylkill County. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce to our viewers a new TV show, Modern Medicine, in which we will explore medical advances on the cutting edge. And I hope to introduce to our viewers medical scientists and clinicians who are literally pushing the outside of the envelope in medical and surgical procedures that have a direct influence on your health. And this evening, our guest is Dr. Whitney Pollack, a longtime uh, colleague. Dr. Pollack is a specialist in gynecology and works at the Gynecology Center in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Whitney, welcome and thank you for joining us here at the Simon Kramer Institute. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. And could you tell us a little bit about your background, your education, and what attracted you to Northeast Pennsylvania? Well, I uh, am orig originally from Florida. Um, I went to undergrad at Vanderbilt University and then medical school in Philadelphia. I then did my residency um, in OBGYN at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. And I decided I really liked the Northeast Pennsylvania area. Uh, my family is originally from Bloomsburg and I really wanted to move back to the area and give back to the area what it had given me. So I looked around, I looked in Wilkes-Barre, looked in Scranton, Danville, and I really liked Pottsville. The people were very friendly, it was a beautiful area, it was safe and I thought it was a great place to raise a family. Well to tell you the truth, many of those same qualities in these patients attracted me to the area. And when we talk about salt of the earth, uh, Schuylkill County is imbued with many of the, those characteristics. I agree. I had big city training, but I want to go back to the small town and, and treat the, the nice, the friendly, compassionate people. It's kind of uh, funny how uh, people, uh, particularly sophisticated patients, they're always looking for the best medical care. And uh, up here patients tend to look down to Reading or Allentown and if you live in Allentown or you live in uh, Reading you're looking towards Philadelphia. Well where do the people in Philadelphia look? They look for New York City or Houston, Texas but uh, what I've found is that people do not check their brains at the door when they uh, leave the tertiary medical centers and come to places like this and it's been a joy to practice in this area with such uh, competent specialists like yourself. I agree, and, and there is a place for academia and big city medicine, but I think if you have that training and you can incorporate that into a, a private practice where you really cater to your patient, we don't have a six week wait, we don't have a two week wait. You got a problem, you come in right now. That's what we do for our patients. Even if I've never seen you before, you can come in today and you'll be seen. That, that you don't always get in a bigger area. You probably know I'm running for uh, Congress, and one of the, um, areas that I'm educating myself on is international medicine and what's going on in, uh, say, our neighbor to the north, Canada. Right. And the waiting period is about nine and a half weeks just to see the consultant. Right. And then when you want to get your hip pinned, it's another 10 weeks. So it's 19 weeks Absolutely. before you can get a procedure done with government medicine, if you will. Why do you think government officials in Canada come to the United States to get their heart transplants? There is a reason why. Point well taken. I wouldn't go anywhere else. Yes. But uh, yeah, at the Simon Kramer Cancer Institute, we have a rule that if somebody calls in, we realize they're not calling in with rheumatoid arthritis. And I use the analogy of an aircraft coming in on short final on an aircraft carrier. We clear the deck for these patients, and our rule is to get them in within uh, 24 to 48 hours. And I've noticed when I've asked you to see a patient, it seems like the same response time as... Uh, and likewise, absolutely. Well, um, there's a couple uh, issues that face uh, women in our county with gynecologic problems. And the one I'm thinking of that uh, I see very often in our patient population is urinary incontinence or stress incontinence. And I noticed in the shelves here, we have a classic textbook on gynecology and... Uh, obstetrics going back to the 50s right. and I was a graduate of uh, Georgetown University uh, Medical School and there was a famous professor there in uh, gynecology and his name was uh, Andrew Marchetti mm -hmm. and this was you know Jefferson or uh, Georgetown's uh, 
contribution to medicine, but um, it was the Marshall Marchetti procedure. Absolutely. I remember, you know, when a woman was uh, leaking urine, that was the procedure of choice. But these people were tied up in the hospital for weeks. Right. And uh, I, I know there's got to be a wetter, better way of doing it. Could you tell us about your experience? Well, there is, and this is a problem that doesn't only address patients in Schuylkill County. It's really a nationwide uh, problem that's um, unfortunately extremely underaddressed. Anyone who has done a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of exercise, maybe a little bit overweight, anyone who's had a baby may uh, have this problem. And it's um, something that women don't particularly like to talk about, but when it's brought up, it'll go bing, 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 bing. Oh, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. And really bringing it out in the open is the thing to do. And I realized what a problem it was in my practice and I decided to uh, learn the most cutting edge pr procedure. I didn't want to learn one of the procedures that you see on TV, God forbid, that's advertised as this big problem and there's all this litigation and, and all of that. Those are, are the older slings, I don't do that. And really not probably the best procedure, not in my opinion. So let me explain what stress urinary incontinence is. Stress urinary incontinence is typically leakage of urine with coughing, sneezing, or with bearing down in some manner. So you have the bladder, okay, and we have the urethra where the urine comes out. Well, there's supposed to be a muscle under here, so when you cough and sneeze, this doesn't move. But if you've had a baby or heavy lifting or whatever, this muscle has relaxed. So when you cough and sneeze, the urethra moves, the urine runs out downhill. It can't defy gravity. So what I do is a 10 minute minor procedure covered by insurance. Um, it's in and out, there's no downtime, no recovery time, and you don't go home with a catheter. What I do is I make a little incision in the vagina, it's about as big as my pinky nail. I lift up the urethra, I thread up a material on one side and attach it, I thread it up on the other, I pull it to the appropriate tension so this can't move, put a stitch in and you're done. Is that all? That's it, most of them take about eight minutes. You, they can cough and sneeze in the recovery room and they will not leak. And I'm into the whole uh, immediate gratification thing. Yes. I love it. When they say you've changed my life in eight minutes, I mean, that's, that's why I went into medicine is for something like that. But it, it lasts, it's not uh, dangerous, it's not one of these materials that you hear the problems with and it's very effective and I haven't had to repeat one or adjust one to this point and I've done hundreds. I've done a little research on the procedure, and uh, it's done under uh, local anesthesia. Just under sedation, like a colonoscopy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to go under general anesthesia, and it's called the single incision adjustable vaginal sling. Now this, again, is not the slings that you're hearing the problems with. This is not the meshes that you're hearing the problems with. This is something totally different and it's really revolutionary and it can change women's lives. No downtime from work. Who can take off six weeks from work? Who can, for, for a bladder problem, who can take off six weeks from being a mom? I know I can't, yeah. so it's really great. What are the long-term results? I mean, you, you talked about the urinary incontinence being achieved coming out of the recovery room. How about at six months or a year? Right. Is, it, is it a durable repair, in other words? Well, I always see them at four months after. And the reason I do that is because the material that's put into the vagina, uh, the body recognizes as almost its own. And your, the patient's tissue starts to grow into the material, and the material becomes the muscle. So the longer you have it, it's almost like the better it gets. And I've see, I see my patients back at four months, they're doing great. I've had people come back a year out, two years out. It's, it's really great. But this type of procedure, although it's been around for a long time, the long-term data is st hasn't really been published yet because of all this controversy about these other procedures. But again, this is not the same procedure. So I wanna emphasize that to patients. This is very uh, easy to undergo, uh, minimal pain. I, I give patients Percocet, they say I don't even have to take a Percocet. Minimal bleeding, just a tiny little bit maybe from the incision. Um, no time, time down from work. Um, also, sexual relations can be resumed in two weeks. And it's great, they, they just love it. Well, it is a foreign material. Is there any risk of infection? Well, I, I caution patients if they are a diabetic um, or if they smoke, they may have um, less potential to heal nicely. If I see that their tissue um, may not heal the way I want, I may um, 
precondition them with a little bit of topical estrogen cream. Now, that's, this is not the estrogen by mouth that we've heard the problems with. This is just a little bit of topical, a little bit of pea size amount around that area where I would make the incision. Um, for every day for about six weeks, it really primes the tissue to heal very nicely. And I really just haven't seen any problems. I have one patient who had been wearing a pad, almost really like a diaper for 20 years. I did this procedure, nothing. She wears nothing now. She's good as new. Absolutely fantastic. And she happened to be a diabetic. So you think that maybe she might not heal as well. She healed beautifully. She did great. Very, very well. Well, it sounds like this, again, uh, with minimal cutting, you're right on the edge. That's true. Yeah. Now, let's also just address the other type of incontinence, which is urge incontinence. That's a separate component, not stress incontinence. That's an overactive bladder. You don't need to take the medications that you see on TV that cause dry mouth and constipation. There are newer medications out and there are newer treatments such as Botox in the bladder that are very effective. Well, thank you for informing us on this. Uh, we're gonna take a short break now as we go to a commercial, and then we have some other issues to address in the field of gynecology. Welcome back to Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. Our guest Today is Dr. Whitney Pollock of the Gynecology Center in Pottsville. Whitney, in the early segment, we were talking about the new procedure of uh, placement of a sling to gain urinary uh, continence in women. Um, could you comment on the effectiveness of exercises? Because again, when the Marshall Marchetti procedure was done, it was kind of an operation of last resort. Uh, do the Kegel exercises have any benefit in the control of this problem, or is that a footnote to medical history where we should just go right to a simple surgical procedure? Um, Dave, I wish they were. Yeah. <laughs> but you're never going to undo Mother Nature, and you're never going to undo childbirth, unfortunately. It might be minimally effective, but really, this surgical procedure is, I call it to my patients, it's the Mercedes. Yes. You can do the forward and do the exercises. You still might get where you're going, maybe but you're not gonna get there as if you did the procedure. So it's, I, I would say, minimally effective. I've had patients try them. They really don't see much of an effect. That has been my experience, but at least it's something for the patients to do while we're waiting. <laughs> exactly. Also, you're a national spokesperson for a procedure called NovaSure. Yes. A little bit outside my field in, in cancer medicine, but I wonder if you could enlighten uh, the viewers about uh, this new procedure, which again, is right on the cutting edge. Right. Novasure is a type of an endometrial ablation, meaning a uterine lining ablation. Now, this, these procedures have been out for 25 years. There's been five different types of ablations. They've used hot water, water balloons, all different kinds of things. This uses radio frequency, and in my opinion, this is the best. This is the only one I do now. I don't even bother to do the other ones because I've ended up having to redo those with this one. Not worth it. So this is a 90-second uh, minor procedure covered by insurance. I do mine 90 up, seconds. 90 seconds. This is for women with heavy, uh, painful you that, periods. You do that in a drive-by uh, setting? Or <laughs> I mean, you want fries seconds. with that? Yes. Um, this, is, this is a procedure that's indicated for women with heavy, painful periods. And a lot of women say, well, you know, I, it's, I've always been like that. I didn't know really if there was anything I could do. And it's, it's typically, unfortunately, not addressed. Unless someone's physician asks them, they say, oh, yeah, well, I do have heavy periods. Well, don't you see this as a problem? Do you really want to live like this? Do you want to have to change your tampon in two hours at your son's baseball game? Do you want to miss out on a whole day of vacation? And... I think they're very grateful that I bother to ask. But m some women, in fact, most women don't see it as a problem because they say, well, that's just how I always was. Well, I don't think it's appropriate to live like that. So I do bring it up to every one of my patients at their annual exam. If I uh, see that they're still within childbearing age and they're having periods, I ask them, you know, do you like your periods five to seven days and heavy? Well, nobody does. Yeah. So then I discuss the Novasure procedure. So it's that 90 second minor procedure covered by insurance. I do mine upstairs in my surgery suite so you don't have to go to the hospital. Wonderful. I do it under sedation, just an IV medication like a colonoscopy. Um, there's no downtime, no recovery time, just that day. So uh, what it is, is there's a probe. It's about uh, as big as the tip of a pen. And I insert it into the um, vagina. There's no pain because there's sedation. It expands up into the uterus. 
and for 90 seconds it emits radio frequency that cauterizes all of the lining of the uterus. So it's a heating? It, it does cause a heating, a cauterization procedure, yes. Then I remove the probe completely um, and after 90 seconds uh, the patient just spontaneously wakes up and um, very little pain, very little discomfort um, and she rec we recover her in our rec recovery area and she goes home. Little to no period for at least the next five years but probably forever. Now uh, the typical um, results for um, national Novisher statistics are that um, about 60% of people have no period at all. My statistics are that 98% of my patients see an improvement and 90% have no period at all. That's pretty good. No wonder you're the national <laughs> spokesperson. Exactly. And I think that comes with operator experience. The more you do, the better you get and the better your results. Um, and not everybody knows how to do this. So I would urge patients, this is, uh, in my opinion, and I, I think I've done a lot of research on this and I've done studies for Novisher um, and conducted quite a bit of research, it's to find someone who knows how to do this type of procedure. It's quick, it's effective, it's, it's pretty much painless. There's some cramping afterwards, which we can control with pain medications, but to, to live your life with no heavy bleeding and no clots and no pain, it's, it's really fabulous. And now let's, let's address this to your clientele and your type of patients. The cancer patient. Yes, yes. the cancer patient. Now, although Novasure does not have the FDA indication to prevent uterine cancer because the lining is destroyed, it probably does. That's what the studies show. Now, it doesn't have the FDA indication, but as an off-label use, could it prevent uterine cancer? Most definitely. Well, there's a risk of uterine cancer in a small segment of uh, breast cancer patients that are taking uh, one older medication called uh, tamoxifen. How would it apply to that group? We have had patients on tamoxifen who do have their lining growing out of control somewhat and I have done ablations on those patients and the lining doesn't grow, they continue their tamoxifen and they're doing great. Well, would it affect uh, the uh, pap smear? No. The, the cancer detection, detection test? No. Would, would not. not. Have any That's just effects. a cervical screening test. Oh. So it's very effective. Are there any complications to this? Um, there procedure? can be some complications. There's been reports of infections. Also, um, someone should not have it if they're interested in future childbearing because the cavity has been altered. Um, but otherwise, it's very well tolerated. And I do give a post op antibiotic just to prevent infection. Wonderful. Yes. Well, uh, we're going to have one more segment, but I think we'll uh, break. Uh, there's some important information for our uh, viewers before we continue on. Welcome back to Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. If you're interested in the information we're presenting tonight, you can reach me at 570-277-6218. I'll be happy to answer your questions and pass on uh, references about this very important topic. Our guest speaker today is Whitney Pollack, who is a gynecologist at the Gynecology Center in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Whitney, again, thank you for being here. We've uh, covered two important areas in gynecology, urinary continence, uh, excessive uh, bleeding, and uh, that would be metrorrhagia or metrorrhagia. Yes. And there's a topic that I think is on uh, many of our viewers' uh, brains. And I remember in medical school, we had a professor that had conducted uh, studies. What are the students thinking of? And he said that it was proven that any given time, uh, a third of the students were actually listening to the professor. <laughs> Another 40% were thinking about sex, and everybody else was wasting their time. So uh, with that as a backdrop, and, uh, and national news was a remark made by Governor Mike Huckabee, and he was referring to the libido of women. And of course, that's on a lot of uh, viewers' uh, uh, frontal cortexes. But um, as people age, hormones change, and libido might be an early casualty. For uh, men, there's a couple of very uh, prominent 
products out there, Viagra, Cialis, etc. But uh, in the case of women, is there anything for women that are having such problems? If there was, Dave, I'd be on it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's, so let's talk about, there's two different issues about uh, decreased libido or decreased sexual desire in menopausal, perimenopausal women. One is, do you just not feel like doing it or does it hurt? So there's two different categories. So the first category, do you just not feel like doing it? Are you tired? Are you stressed out? Are you moody and irritable because of menopause? Are you sleepless because you're having hot flashes all night and night sweats? What is the reason that you just don't feel like doing it? A lot of people say, I don't know, it's just menopause. I just don't feel like it. Well, that may be some of it. Some of the hormonal fluctuations can be part of it, but a lot of it is because the symptoms of menopause are infringing on their daily living and on their natural desires. So if we can fix some of those symptoms, a lot of times the libido can come back. So if they're up all night because they're having hot sweats, then we can fix it. But let me stress that there are non-estrogen postmenopausal and menopausal treatments for symptoms such as hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, irritability, and vaginal dryness. It doesn't have to be estrogen. There's a new medication actually out called Osfina. It's an oral medication, very much like tamoxifen, very much like Avista, that actually targets the vaginal tissues and makes them more lubricated and more healthy without using estrogen. It's not an estrogen. This is really a breakthrough for women who are not candidates for estrogen because of breast or endometrial cancer, and for women who have not responded to traditional treatments for uh, vaginal dryness. But let's get back to those women that just don't feel like it. Well, a lot of times there's that irritability, that moodiness, that just get away from me type of feeling, if, and we can fix that. We can fix that with some uh, low dose medications that will really just take the edge off, make them feel like their old selves, not make them sedated, not make them zombies, but really help them and make them into the person they used to be. Then a lot of women find that the libido comes back. Now, there was a medication that was supposed to come out from a major drug manufacturer about six uh, years ago. And this had um, a component of testosterone in it because testosterone is the natural sex hormone for women. It does tend to decline in perimenopause and menopause. Well, the medication did work. It increased sexual desire, that's for sure. But the women also grew be beards and their voices deepened, so it never made it to the mainstream. Nobody would want to take that. So I also tell my patients, if there's an intimacy issue, address that. Become more intimate with your partner. Go out, have a nice weekend, go out to dinner, have a glass of wine. If it takes watching a movie or something a little different, a little racy, there's nothing wrong with that. If you, it's that intimacy that has to um, be regained if, and that's sometimes lost during perimenopause. Let's then also talk about the women who have vaginal dryness. Like I said, there's that uh, medication by mouth called Osfina that just came out. And uh, there is topical estrogens. Topical estrogens work very well for women. There's some creams that can be applied maybe three times a week that you'll see a difference after about six weeks. And there's um, a pill called Vagifem that can be inserted up into the vagina and it dissolves. Do not take that pill by mouth. It's an intravaginal pill. Stranger things have happened, but it does work. And it dissolves and it makes the tissues healthy and lubricated. And intercourse doesn't need to be painful in perimenopausal and menopausal women. The medical term for that condition is called dyspareunia. That's painful intercourse. Painful intercourse. Due to vaginal atrophy or yeah. the tissues kind of shrinking in, away and drying up. And we don't, they don't need to do that. It doesn't need to be like that. The um, watchword in medical school was dyspareunia was better than no perunia at all. <laughs> that, I haven't heard that one, but that's true. <laughs> um, I'm going to change uh, topics here. Okay. Uh, you were alluding to hormone replacement therapy, right? which has gotten a bad rep in recent years with uh, probably induction of breast cancer. You are uh, treating uh, people at this risk. Can you talk to us about some of the new diagnostic tests that might be available to our patients? Well, the WHI study that came out around 2002, 2003, which was the largest um, study with excellent medical evidence that showed that uh, postmenopausal estrogen does increase the risk of breast cancer, heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's, and dementia, has led many gynecologists and many uh, primary care physicians to back away from that postmenopausal use of estrogen. Also, women say, well, I'm not on that much. That doesn't really matter. 
and it doesn't matter, it's not dose dependent. But for women who may be at risk, whether they have a first degree relative, multiple relatives, if they've had breast cancer themselves, I would recommend the BRCA1 and 2 genetic testing. It's a simple blood test, uh, a full history needs to be taken, the results need to be discussed fully, but I believe knowledge is power. I don't believe ignorance is bliss. And when you have knowledge, you can make an informed decision as to what to do. Well, Whitney, we are just really scratching the surface on topics that are of great interest to our viewership. If the viewers have any questions, how would they get in touch with you? Um, they can go to drwhitneypollock.com and they can call my office at 570-628-WIT-9448. Uh, WIT is W-H-I-T, which is 9448. Whitney, well, you have been our inaugural address on uh, Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. I hope to have you back again to inform us on of uh, developments on the cutting edge. Thank you for watching Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. I hope you tune in again in the future.